OK, so history and development of the internet. A couple, a couple of sort of introductory slides first about the course more generally. Um, first of all, why is policy and regulation uh, what a, a core course on this degree? Um, well, a number of reasons that you can see up there. Um, first of all, for the impact that they have on the technology that we are studying. So uh, whilst on the one hand, you, you rarely see governments pass laws that say, you know, your laptop must do X. It's very rarely that sledge, sledgehammer. Uh, you do have things like data protection laws, copyright laws, laws about uh, defamation, libel, obscenity, so on and so on and so on, uh, that to some extent shape the way that technology companies have to design not just the, the gadgets that they're selling you, but obviously the services that they are offering online, uh, what internet service providers will allow you to do as, a, as an ISP customer, what, what they won't allow you to do, under which circumstances they might even boot you off the network, um, particularly if uh, people that own copyrighted works allege that you've been sharing them illegally. That's something that we'll come back to in the, the copyright lecture. Um, a lot of co communications studies scholars do work on policy and regulation. Uh, Sandra Braman, that's a quote from there, is one of the, the very well-known people. Uh, you, can, you can obviously look up references as we go along if you want to follow them up. Um, and a second, a second thing to think about is in, in looking at the debates around policy, often governments and people lobbying for particular policies will, will cite research. That's a good thing. You would, you would hope that um, policy is evidence-based, uh, that people have some reason to lobby for particular internet policies beyond just, well, it's good for me and my business. Often, of course, that, what, that is what lies behind uh, policies. Uh, and so hopefully this course will, will help you take the research that you do and that you learn about elsewhere on this MSc and look at lobbying discourse and think, well, I can see that that's a good point. You know, I've, I've read that study, or I have a, a rough idea what this study says. And yes, it would predict that this law would have this effect and is something that governments should be for or against. But in some cases, it will just be blatant self-interest. And that's something that's important for you to be able to disentangle. Um, and secondly, you might say, just for this lecture, well, what is interesting about the history of communications technology? A lot of people find the internet exciting because it's so fast moving and things are changing so quickly and it's because of the impact it's having in changing society. Who cares about what was going on in the, the 19th century with the telegraph, which I'll talk a little bit about, or even the, the 16th, 17th century with the printing press. But what I hope this lecture will show you is that a lot of the debates that go on about internet policy actually stretch back a very long way. They're not, they haven't come out of the blue. Mm -hmm. A real a real um, curse of de debate about internet policy is this internet exceptionalism, that the internet changes everything. Uh, you know, that the, the centuries and centuries of, of laws that countries like the UK have built up are just completely irrelevant given the internet. And often that's not true at all. Often there, there are all sorts of uh, interesting debates, historical debates that you can look back to and say, well, yes, the internet might change this to some degree. Uh, but it's not completely out of the blue. So first of all, the printing press. If you're, if you're interested in this era, era of history, the, the, one of the recommended readings is a really, fasc really fascinating book. I really recommend it. Elizabeth Eisenstein, uh, The Printing Press in Early Modern Europe, I think it's called. It's on the, it's on the reading list. Uh, and basically what, what she sets out is, well, first, you know, going back to Gutenberg, I'm sure you've heard of, the, the printing press, the person that he didn't sort of invent printing, actually going back centuries before. There were, there were things that sort of looked like printing, particularly, I think, in Asia. Uh, but this was, this was the sort of the, the moment when it came together, when the, the technology worked efficiently enough, was cheap enough that it could be very widely diffused very quickly through uh, society. So Gutenberg took took a, a very well understood technology, which was basically olive presses, you know, literally you put, put olives on them and squash them, uh, and combined that with movable type. So the, the, thing, the thing that had made printing basically I, so expensive that it just wasn't used up to this point, by and large, was that if you're going to 
print something by literally you know, spreading ink and pressing it against paper. You have to set the type first. And if you have to do, you know, if you have to hand carve, essentially, your uh, type, then that's a very expensive and inefficient way of doing it. Whereas movable type is that you have individual letters that you can rearrange um, and then print and then change again and print a second book. And you might think that sounds absurdly simple, and it is. But uh, this, was, this was the sort of moment when that technology first really took off. And in the short to medium term, uh, you can say, well, did, did it have really a huge impact? People were mainly interested. What, 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 what book do you think was mainly printed? This printing? Bibles, exactly. That was the thing that people thought this technology was good for. Printing Bibles, wonderful. Uh, you know, the thing that everyone wants to read. Um, but one of the interesting you know, lessons you can learn from the printing press, which applies equally to the internet, I think, is that new technologies often in the short, the short to medium term, maybe, you know, in, in decades historically, short to medium term, which is still where we are with the internet, they are often used to just do something, to do something that had previously been quite widely done already, i.e. to produce Bibles, uh, and just do it faster and more efficiently. And yes, lots more Bibles were printed, uh, but that's a limited impact. It was in the long run, actually, that the, the printing press uh, had a much more significant impact. And whilst you do read a lot of books about the internet saying, you know, this, is, this will change everything, you have to read those with a grain of salt. It can be true. You know, it's, not, it's not always false to say that a technology will change everything in the long run. It, it, this book by Elizabeth Einstein really beautifully sets out what an amazing impact the printing press had in the, in the very long run, in the centuries and centuries, on Western society. So first of all, un until this point, it used to be the case essentially that knowledge decayed. Because if people you know, did experiments, they didn't really do experiments in the modern scientific sense. You know, the, the scientific revolution came later. But as people created knowledge, as they explored the world and drew maps, for example, or, or wrote about local history, um, they could literally write it, and that would decay over time. You know, there would only be a very small number of copies produced that might be in one of the very small numbers of libraries of, of, of the time, you know, of Oxford University, of a few other universities around Europe. But that knowledge decayed, whereas the printing press meant that suddenly you could produce essentially unlimited copies of knowledge, um, and therefore people could start to build on knowledge. Rather than having to spend all their time trying to recreate the knowledge that people had previously developed, searching out the, the, the wisdom of the ancients, as they used to put it. A lot of scholars in this period spent all their time trying to work out what it was the Romans and Greeks had discovered 2,000 years earlier, almost. Uh, so printing allowed um, the accumulation of knowledge, which in the long run clearly uh, has an enormous impact on, on science and knowledge on society more broadly. Secondly, I mentioned the, I mentioned the Bibles already. One of the perhaps unexpected things that the Bible, uh, the printing press and the Bible combination did was previously, by and large, the Bibles that were, were available, that had been you know, beautifully hand illuminated by monks, were in Latin. And most ordinary people could not read Latin. It, many of them couldn't read English. Uh, you know, English people couldn't read English. But uh, vernacular editions, translations of the Bibles into the language that the majority of the population spoke meant that suddenly the, the masses, who, was, who were very religious, but up, up until that point had had to rely essentially on the church to interpret the Bible for them, could read the Bible for themselves. And they could perhaps start to disagree with the uh, authority in the church that they previously had had to completely rely on to tell them how they could go to heaven. I mean, that was, again, that, sorry if that sounds incredibly simplistic, but that was, that was how important it was. And suddenly, uh, you could have dissent within the church. And indeed, Martin Luther, who famously wrote his 95 theses and uh, banged them to the door of a church in Germany, which challenged the, the authority of the Catholic Church, uh, those theses, because of printing, spread very quickly across Europe and led to the Reformation, led to the creation, ultimately, of the <coughs> Protestant churches in opposition to the Catholic Church. And of, of course, one of the features of Protestant churches, they, they are much less authority-based. You know, it's much less that there is a pope 
whose archbishops and bishops and priests will tell you how you should live your life. Uh, Protestant, Protestantism generally is more about people reading the Bible, having an individual relationship with God. And finally, um, do you know what this drawing is, this sketch? It's sort of very important from scientific history. It's the planets. Yeah, solar system. It, exactly. It's the solar system. And up until this point, by and large, people thought the, the, uh, the universe revolved around the Earth. <coughs> um, and Copernicus was the first person to sort of seriously propose, well, actually, uh, no, the Earth revolves around the Sun, and the other planets also revolve around the Sun. Those are the orbits that he proposed, although the orbits are actually elliptical. But um, that, that was one of the, the, sort of, the sort of first moments of the, uh, the scientific revolution, where because of this accumulation of knowledge, suddenly knowledge began to develop at a much faster rate than it had up until the printing press. And uh, you're using the fruits of this. Uh, of course, everything around us um, enormously, enormously changed ultimately by that um, scientific re ongoing scientific revolution. So having said all of that, what are some of the regulation issues that are relevant for internet discussions? Well, su su some surprisingly uh, similar uh, issues came up even then. So there was, um, you know, the, the, the printing press was being used to produce all sorts of books uh, some of which the existing um, authorities were not too happy about because they were a challenge to those authorities, particularly the church. So the Catholic Church had an index of prohibited books uh, that said, uh, in Catholic nations, printers must not print these books. Of course, that list was a wonderful list for people who wanted to see what was upsetting the church. And actually, <laughs> the books on, those, on that list you know, became best, the sort of bestsellers of the day. Uh, because Protestant printers were quite happy to print them. Um, so that's, you know, ongoing debates about internet censorship. One of the problems with saying controversial videos, perhaps, the, the innocence of Muslims being one in the media a great deal over the last few weeks. Uh, one problem with, ban I mean, not, not so much in that case because it's already so notorious, but one, one problem with banning things, putting books on and web pages on lists of banned content is, uh, well, you'll encourage some people to go and look at them, and you're unlikely to ever completely squelch them. So, you know, in exactly this way, because there were Protestant printers who were willing to produce the books, that, that index was not particularly effective. Um, secondly, uh, the, the royal families of the time um, had some problems with printing. So the, the British royal family, Queen Mary, came to a deal basically with the Stationers Guild, the, the guilds in the UK and I think in many other European countries were basically professional cartels, groups of merchants that would, uh, in the modern sense, they would self-regulate. So they would try, in some ways, they would set rules for their members that would try to uh, make the businesses work for the good of society as well as for themselves. But also, of course, cartels are always used to bump up prices and to uh, screw the consumer, basically. Uh, and that's as true today as it was then. But um, Queen Mary came to a deal with the Stationers Guild, which was the, the Publishers Guild, and which still exists today, actually, in, in London. Uh, and what they agreed was she would give them an exclusive right to print books in England in exchange for an agreement that they, they would not produce seditious and heretical books, so basically things that would challenge the reign of Queen Mary. Um, of course, that didn't stop the printers in Scotland printing those books again. But, uh, but sort of interesting bargains between different groups in society. Uh, and of course, that quite quickly linked also to the idea of intellectual property, particularly copyright to do with books. Um, this quote from Eisenstein, so around the same time, the, the 16th century, uh, people were starting to come up with the idea that ultimately then became the first copyright law in the world in, Engl in England, the Statute of Anne in 1710, that authors should have uh, some control over the reprinting of their of their works um, to encourage learned men to compose and write useful books, and I'll come back to that in the copyright lecture. So that's the printing press, the second of the two historical technologies I'm going to talk about today. The telegraph, clearly a lot closer as a technology to to the internet. Um, goes back perhaps 
further than you might immediately expect because it was originally it was an optical technology. There were towers like this built around uh, France and the UK, and these arms above the tower would be moved like semaphore, more like modern day semaphore. And the person at the next tower, a few tens of kilometers away, could see and could change theirs to match it. And that way you could pass messages along these chains of towers. Uh, that was used, for example, in the Napoleonic Wars by uh, the, both armies um, to coordinate their activities. In the 1830s, <coughs> you've heard of Morse, I'm sure, from Morse code, uh, invented a way of sending, sending this using essentially radio, electromagnetic transmission, which is much faster. Um, very quickly, even you know, within, within 20 years, you already had Associated Press and Reuters, news agencies that still exist today, using this technology to deliver news to be reprinted by newspapers. Um, and then, from a, interestingly, from a regulation perspective, you might have heard in the last couple of months, if you, if you follow internet regulation in the, in the news, that the ITU is trying to take over the internet. I'm sure you've heard that. Uh, that's this United Nations body, which is now the, called the International Telecommunications Union. That dates back to this period when, uh, first of all, country by country, as, as, peop as countries were setting up telegraph networks, they thought, well, wouldn't it be a good idea if we would link together our country's networks so we can send international telegrams? Uh, so first, Austria and Prussia uh, signed a treaty to set the details of how they did that. UK, France very quickly, UK, US. Uh, and that those were initially bilateral treaties just between two countries, but they quickly became international treaties between a number of countries and led to the creation of the body that's now called the ITU at the United Nations. Um, New York City, the stock exchange and traders were already using this by 1867 to transmit stock prices. It, up to that point, people who wanted to trade had to, be, had to have their offices literally in or next door to the exchanges and run in and out to find prices and do trades. Telegram, telegraphs allowed them to, to do that remotely to some extent. And then uh, Thomas Edison uh, made some significant improvements to the technology. And Alexander Graham Bell in 1876 came up with the idea of the telephone. The telegram, telegraph was about sending words, uh, sort of written word equivalents, obviously the telephone. Bell and others realized, well, what, why can't we use similar technologies to have voice calls? Uh, filed the patents 1876, and within a decade, a quarter of a million telephones in use around the world. So again, yes, the internet has diffused through society remarkably quickly. That you know there are now over a billion internet users in the world, <laughs> another billion to two billion people accessing the internet via phones, but. It was only a decade in a, in a world that had a much smaller population. I think it was about a billion at the time. Uh, the telephone diffused very rapidly. So again, some regulatory issues uh, from that. That international interconnection issue is, is fas remains fascinating. This is a big thing about the internet. It, you often hear people say the internet is, uh, is stateless or nationless. You know, it is an international network. Of course, that doesn't stop the states regulating people and companies and equipment within their own borders. But a lot of the interesting policy issues the internet raises is to do with that international nature. The, the, telegr the telegraph was always much more government controlled, right from those, those treaties being signed with very detailed rules about what could and couldn't be sent on the, on the telegraph connections, unlike the internet today. Um, codes and ciphers. Uh, encryption is an ongoing argument in internet policy about should, should, should governments be able to decrypt encrypted messages that people are sending on the internet if they suspect uh, criminal activity. And there was the same, the same issue with the telegraph, that, that initially people weren't, weren't supposed to send encrypted telegrams because the governments of the day wanted to be able to read the telegrams, to intercept them and to read them. Uh, but people were using them covertly, not so much actually uh, because there was a huge number of criminals that wanted to take advantage of the telegraph, but more because, um, first of all, it saved them money, because rather than writing out long sentences, you could compress them into, into much smaller. You could use code words. You, know, you could use short code, word, code words to represent much longer phrases and sentences. So because people were paying by the letter, 
when they sent telegrams, that would save them money. But also it allowed them to do things which they weren't supposed to do, like um, insider trading, effectively, uh, to, to do with the stock market, gambling information. Uh, up until the, the, tele, the telegraph became widely used, you, you used to be able to do things, for example, you could bet on horse races that had already finished. Because if they were a significant distance away, nobody could possibly know what the outcome of the race had been until a messenger arrived. You know, so you could say uh, a, a horse race that happened five, you know, 300 miles away, maybe it would take, I don't know how many hours, mm. uh, for a horse to travel 300 miles. Um, until that point, everyone was in the same boat. You know, nobody could possibly know, and so you could gamble. Of course, the telegram completely changed that. You could instantaneously know what was happening at a, at a distance. And Eisenstein's book brings that out quite nicely. What a, a shift in the way of thinking it was that, that suddenly people could know what was happening elsewhere, almost as it happened, rather than finding out days or even weeks later in the case of international news that would have taken a very long time to spread at that point. Um, and then lastly, uh, the, te the telegraph again, interestingly, just like the internet, a lot of the initial infrastructure was built using government funding because it was very expensive. It was something that individual companies couldn't have afforded to do. And then over time, as it became very popular, governments drew back and, and said, OK, we're going to hand this over to the private sector and people that want to use it have to pay for it, just like the internet. Uh, so you might say, well, thank goodness, finally we get to the thing that we're interested in. Um, so the internet. Very briefly, I won't sort of bore you with the long history of it, but it goes back to, you know, if you had to pick one moment when the internet was conceived or invented, it would be 1964, this person, Paul Baran, who worked at Rand Corporation in the US, which is a body that does research for the US um, Air Force, essentially. Uh, he came up with the idea of a survivable network. There was a lot of debate at the time about uh, nuclear war. That was a great preoccup you know, the, the Cold War, the preoccupation of people in the West and you know, the US particularly versus the USSR. The US government was very concerned about a nuclear, a surprise nuclear attack wiping out very significant parts of their capabilities so they couldn't launch a counter strike. The whole, um, the mutually assured destruction um, theory that both sides were, were using in the Cold War, which was essentially, OK, the other side has weapons that can literally annihilate completely uh, my country. How do we stop them using those? OK, well, we build the same weapons, and we say, if you do that, we will launch a counter-strike and annihilate your country. That was the logic of the Cold War. And if that's your plan, then you have to be concerned about a, a, a surprise strike knocking out your infrastructure and stopping you launching that counter-strike, because that then gives an incentive to the other side to, to do precisely that. If they, if they are, feel very threatened by you, well, the logical thing is to annihilate you with no chance of, the, of being annihilated in return. So Baran was thinking about how to build communications networks that could not be knocked out easily by a surprise nuclear strike. Uh, the problem with the telephone and telegraph network from that regard was it was very, it, there were lots of centralized points where lines came together. And if you blew those up, you would take out the whole network. So the idea of the survivable network, which became the internet, is well, you, ha you don't have those big concentrations. You have lots and lots of links that look more like a mesh than a, a star, if you like. And a message can take lots of different routes. So even if 90% of the internet was blown up, actually a lot of traffic would still be able to get to its final destination. I don't know if you remember uh, on 9-11, um, one, uh, one of the problems that day was that the Twin Towers were right next to some of the main landing points for fiber optic cables coming into the US that carry a lot of internet data to and from the US. And when the uh, Twin Towers collapsed, they damaged a lot of that equipment. But the internet didn't fall over that day, in, you know, not in, in that region or between the US and Europe, for precisely that reason. That the traffic, even though a lot of people were using the internet because people wanted to find out what was going on and look at news pages and so on, the traffic could flow via different routes. Uh, similarly, and not as, not as well known, but it, often you find out in the history of science, it's not, 
you know, it's not one person that had the idea. One person had an idea. Someone else had quite a similar idea at the same time. And they, didn't, they hadn't <laughs> talked to each other beforehand. And that was the case here. So a British physicist called Donald Davies had come up with the idea that he, of what he called a packet-switched network. Um, I think, Joss, last week, didn't he talk about the difference between circuit-switched and packet-switched networks? So it was his idea to, to use packets rather than circuits for the efficiency gains. Um, the thing that turned these sort of, it, so Baran, that was a research paper. This was a bit more practical. Donald Davies was working for a UK government agency, uh, but he didn't have lots of money to go and build this network that he envisaged. Uh, that actually came when the US government advanced research projects agency that funded military technologies decided, well, we've, we are funding these strange computer things in universities, mainly well around the US, obviously, because it was a US government agency, particularly, particularly at MIT, but also at, at UCLA on the West Coast. And uh, these people at ARPA thought, well, we're sitting in Washington or in Boston. Wouldn't it be nice if we could actually connect to those computers on the West Coast, see what they're doing, and make use of them, and more broadly, that universities could share computing capacity? And so they decided they would start funding a research program to develop technologies to do that, which took up these ideas of the packet, packet switch networks and started building what was originally called the ARPANET that then became the Internet. If these are the sort of grandfathers of the Internet, these are the direct fathers. Uh, so Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, who invented the TCP IP protocols Joss talked about last week, uh, in the, mainly in the 70s, and then 1981 was when the internet sort of had a big switch over and said, everyone on the internet is going to use TCP IP from this point on. So that was the modern internet, if you like. You know, the moment that the internet, as it is today, came into, a, came into being was, was that moment. At the same time, a couple of other interesting points, I'll say a little bit more. Um, <coughs> these two, with wonderful beards, were programmers at AT&T Research Labs, and they came up with I'm sure you've heard of Unix, an operating system for computers that was very popular, that today Linux is, but is a form of Unix. Uh, also a programming language called C, which is very widely used today uh, to write software. Um, something called New Network News, which was, which was a sort of early discussion forum uh, set of software, which I'll say a little bit more. That was developed into, I'll say more about these in a moment, tools for people to communicate and have discussions long before Web 2.0 came along um, in the, the late 70s, early 80s, ways for people to talk to each other, even when their computers weren't permanently connected to the internet. Because how many of you remember dial-up? Or are you slightly too young for that? Only some of you do. So yes, you know that was until quite recently, the internet, for most people, the experience wasn't broadband always on. It was, I sit down on my computer, I you know, click a button, my modem dials up. Um, and th these pieces of software were ways of efficiently sending around discussions without people having to always be connected and run up their phone bills to the internet. And then, of course, Tim Berners-Lee. Is anyone from Queen's College at Oxford? Anyone? Any of you? Queen's College? No. He was a, he was a physics student undergraduate there, and they, they've named one of their rooms after him later when he was working at uh, CERN, which is a nuclear research facility in Switzerland. He came up with the idea of the World Wide Web. Uh, and you know what has happened since then. So this is, this is the idea I was talking about with Paul Baran, the, the centralized network versus the starting to decentralize. So you don't have one big central point that can be blown up. You have more points, some of which could be blown up, and which that would still be quite damaging to a, to a fully distributed mesh uh, that then is very hard uh, to, to completely stop communications from flowing. Because even if you take out you know, a large number of the nodes in the middle, there are other, still other routes that traffic can flow by. And actually, that's the simple reason why internet censorship is hard. Um, you might have heard the, the phrase, uh, the internet interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. That's precisely what we're talking about. You know, if you're a government and you say, well, I control these ISPs here, I, like, you know, well, the well-known example of the Chinese government, you control all the ISPs in your country, and you tell them you will block access to these sites. It only takes one rogue connection outside those ISPs to, to form a route 
that traffic can then start to flow through. Um, so I've said most of that already, actually. Um, I said ARPA had funded this ARPANET. Uh, this is, this is um, <laughs> in effect, the first internet router. So the things, the nodes that, that forward packets along links. They were, originally, they were called interface message processors, IMPs. They were enormous, as you can see at this point. Um, this guy, Leonard Kleinrock, was a professor at UCLA that was, uh, he always complains that Surf and Khan get all the credit for inventing the internet. And it was his imp. His was the first imp. Uh, so he's another person that was significant in the creation of the internet. Um, UCLA, UCLA uh, was one of the first four nodes. MIT, I think University of California at San Diego, some, and somewhere in Colorado were the first four internet nodes. Uh, but then it internationalized quite quickly. And University College London uh, was the first international node, uh, along with the Norwegian army. They set up a satellite link um, into, into ARPANET in the, I think that was the early 80s. So I vaguely mentioned this, this pre-Web 2.0 social software. So I'm sorry if there's lots of acronyms and geekiness here, but this Unix to Unix copy thing uh, was a way for computers running Unix to distribute information between themselves. Uh, and then built on top of that was this news, network news discussion protocol that, that uh, people developed software for on the ARPANET. Um, but also, the interesting thing about this UUCP was it could run uh, on computers that weren't directly connected to the ARPANET. Because originally, the ARPANET was, was basically just universities. It was very expensive to have those interface message processors and also to have the uh, always on <coughs> high bandwidth links, even though, of course, high bandwidth then was, was much smaller probably than your smartphone bandwidth today. Uh, but this UUCP thing allowed people running personal computers, which, which were just starting to take off in the very late 70s, um, to plug into this network, this, dis this discussion network of news, and uh, take part in discussion forums. And so um, Steve Bellavin, who is now a professor at Columbia University in New York, and that actually has just become the, first, the second chief technologist at the Federal Trade Commission in the US, when he was a graduate student with two of his colleagues, wrote some of this news software to distribute discussion and newsletters. Um, they had what they called hierarchies of discussion groups. So uh, most of them were very geeky, because it was geeks that were mainly using this stuff. They were talking about technology. But there was one of the hierarchies that was called rec for recreation. and. This is a, a dreadful geek joke that they, they decided they wouldn't have sex and drugs discussion. But of course, someone created rock and roll discussion. That's a really bad joke. But um, there were thousands and thousands of these discussion groups where anyone that was running this software on their home computer could, could try to plug into the network. They might have to find a friendly local university that would let them. But usually, they could do that. Uh, and then take part in, in all of these discussions. And news does still exist today. You can actually get news clients. All these thousands of discussion groups still exist, but it's not, they're not nearly so widely used. Does anyone use them? Has anyone ever used them? Yeah. So you, they might come up in search results sometimes, for example. Uh, but yeah, by and large, people have moved on to all the various Web 2.0 tools. Um, who has seen this, this great early 80s movie, War Games, which I recommend if you haven't. It's, um, it's, ba it's Matthew Broderick, one of his earliest films. Uh, basically, you know, teenage hacker um, with his little clunky computer hacks into a government computer. And he thinks it's just playing a, a war simulation. But actually, it's not. It's the computers that could launch the nuclear uh, weapons of the US government. And, you know, things go from there, but it was a it was a, a a big popular culture thing in the in the 80s. You know, this idea of the teenage hacker sitting at home, uh, taking over government computers or company computers, and obviously hackers are still still in the news. Um, FidoNet, which was another social network uh, discussion system, had a lot of users. I mean, you can see there, even 1983, 100,000 users, mainly in the U.S., but some international up to 3 million in the late 90s. 
And then, of course, all of the internet technologies you're more familiar with developed and people gradually moved, moved towards the standard internet rather than these sort of add-ons, plug-ins, cludges, ways of getting onto the internet, so the web. Uh, the web itself is not, is not, you know, that wasn't Tim Berners-Lee's idea in 1989. You can actually go back to the 1930s um, in the, in the run-up to the Second World War. Uh, there was a scientist at the US government called Vannevar Bush uh, who wrote, who basically came up with the idea of the web um, in the 1930s and wrote a paper about it called As We May Think, which you can find online. If you read the Atlantic uh, magazine, online magazine today, he, he, he eventually published this article in the Atlantic uh, after the Second World War. Um, he'd been trying to work out ways to coordinate the work of all the scientists that were supporting the US war effort. And actually, that was the same reason that almost that led Berners-Lee to, to come up with the World Wide Web. It wasn't uh, nuclear weapons. It was just nuclear physics research. But again, he was thinking, well, we have this sort of crude ARPANET thing. But surely we can do better in terms of making it easier for scientists to share data and to share papers and documents and so on. Uh, and that's when he came up with the web in 89. The, the, thi the, the thing the web made much easier than before was um, it was easy to run a web server. So it made it very easy for people to run web servers. It wasn't just big institutions like universities or big companies or government agencies that could do it. Anyone could run it, run one, even at home. I mean, if you're running Windows, that has a web server built in today and has done for quite a long time. And also, it was easy for anyone to write web pages. That was the other sort of innovation, rather than some sort of very complicated, geeky system that you had to be a real technical expert to use. He made it very simple for people to create web basic web pages uh, and put them online. Originally, his system didn't have graphics. The thing that made it really take off was when uh, a wet, a, a, again, a PhD student. So PhD students are the sort of heroes of the internet, if you like. Um, wrote a web browser called Mosaic, uh, which became Nav Netscape, which became Firefox. So I'm sure some of you are using Firefox. That, this was the origins of it. That added images, and that suddenly made the web a lot more attractive for non-scientists. And so it took off really, really quickly from then. Microsoft uh, launching Internet Explorer in '95. Blogs actually go back to 94. So the whole the sort of Web 2 phenomenon that you might think, well, that's probably a, a this decade phenomenon, or the last 10 years at least, actually goes back further, but really took off in the last 10 years. Social networking sites, obviously. Does anyone not have a Facebook account? I just deleted mine a few months ago because I was irritated by Mark Zuckerberg's pronouncements on privacy. So I'll see how long I manage to stay cold turkey. but. Um, uh, we shall see. Um, anything else developing? Anyone seen a technology sit that's sort of newer than social networking sites that really made them think, wow, this will be as big as social networking sites. This will change the way people use the internet. Any ideas? Well, HTML5 is changing the landscape quite a lot. Yeah. Could you say just a little bit more for people who don't know it so well? <coughs> um, it's basically just a new way of, it's a much more flexible way of having media, integrating media into HTML. So for example, instead of having to rely on Flash or Shockwave or things for interactive media, people are migrating to HTML5. One of the main consequences of that is, for example, Apple not allowing HTML5 on their iOS browser, um, you know, really irritated a lot of people because it meant that they couldn't access the content they wanted. And um, it's just developing into a huge thing. I, that's a good one. So that, yeah, so it's make, it'll make it a lot easier for cross-platform content on mobile devices yeah. for, for that reason. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of inclusion of media in the content, I think at least uh, YouTube, or at least the ability of people to put video, <laughs> video to broadcast yeah. videos. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing? Yeah. <coughs> Even Apple's latest. Yeah. <laughs> Web 3.0. And, and what would you say, how would you say 3.0 is different to 2.0? I mean, it's, it's the semantic web is basically tagging yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Berners-Lee's sort of more recent um, obsession, that this idea of the semantic web that you, instead of just media, whether it's text or video or so on, you, you put metadata up that allows computers to understand 
the data. And then that, you might think, well, so who cares? But that, that means then you can, you can do much more powerful things in terms of analyzing the data that's out there. So uh, search engines, for example, can not just, you know, you search for term. Today, the search engine can say, here's a web page that contains that term. The idea of the semantic web is the search engine could actually answer your questions because you know, the search engine would understand the data that's in. For, you know, to give you an example that works today, if you search for flights from London to New York, Google will say, here are the schedules and here are the airlines. You know, Google is plugged into the airline computers directly. It's not just saying you know, British, Ed British Airways is advertising a flight from London to New York. It's telling you what all the data is. And so sort of imagine that on steroids. Uh, if, or if, you use, if you've used Wolfram Alpha, the, uh, that's exactly the same thing. You know, they will, they, they, the search engines will become much more intelligent. They'll start to answer your questions directly for you. So just a few more, a few more slides. Uh, that's sort of where we are up to today. I'll just quickly give you a little bit of um, background about where we, me and some of my colleagues who did a study for the European Commission on this question, think the internet is going in the next 20 years. Uh, so what we did was. Uh, first of all, a, a large survey of online survey of, of um, about I think we invited about a thousand people to take part in this survey, giving us their thoughts on on when certain things would uh, become first of all become very widespread. So things like uh, you know when would the internet be the primary source of news and information you know across society, not just for people who are enthusiastic about technology. Would it be now is the blue? Then within five years is the red, green is 10 years, longer, never. So, so looking at how people, how experts thought uses will change, um, I think, yeah, we got about 200 responses uh, and also held a workshop, developed some scenarios about how the internet is likely to develop. We're not trying to predict this is exactly what we think will happen, but coming up with some plausible scenarios about how the internet could develop so that the European Union then can say, well, we, li you know, we like this bit of this scenario. We don't like so much this scenario. We can fine tune our policies to try to, to nudge um, at least the European users of the internet uh, in this direction. So we came up with these four scenarios, also based on um, things that we know are likely to happen over the next 20 years. So for example, you can predict demographic change quite easily, obviously, at least for the people, you know, the babies that have been born today, you know, roughly, uh, they'll be there in 20 years time in, in the same place that they were born, for example. Um, so the four scenarios, you can tell me after this, which ones you think you, you, you would like the internet to develop and which ones less so. So first, the, the smooth trip was the sort of things continue roughly predictably linearly as they are developing. To, to, to until today, so that the internet becomes even more pervasive across all areas of public and private life. Uh, online education becomes um, a critical part of European economies that are trying to stay at the high value add of the, the economic spectrum. You've got to train your workforce, obviously, if you want them to be doing things at that high, high end uh, of the economy. And the aging workforce, the, you know, the demographics are very clear on that across the, across the developed world populations are getting older, people will have to retire later uh, if social security systems are going to stay solvent. Um, work and relationships increasingly conducted online. Many more services provided at least partially online, e.g. Uh, telemedicine. So you might, you might already, do, do most people already to some extent communicate with their physicians, doctors, using some online tools, emails, SMSs, that kind of thing. You know, that's starting to take off now, but you can imagine particularly in areas outside big cities, uh, telemedicine could be a really uh, big thing for people. If they can get access to health specialists hundreds of miles away online, uh, that will have, a, will have a big impact. And this is a slightly optimistic scenario, you may say, uh, that digital divides narrow. You know, one concern about the internet becoming ever more pervasive in public and private life is, well, what about the people who, who aren't using the internet? Do you just abandon them? Of course, governments don't want to do that. Uh, so we suggested that, well, if, if technology companies focus more on usability, so tools that everyone can use, not just technology enthusiasts, uh, lower cost comes almost for free uh, as technology continues to develop, and, and a focus on what people want to use the technology for, we, we 
were optimistic that these digital divides might reduce, um, that development of the internet itself would be incremental, that things like augmented reality projected user interfaces, you know, so you have your phone, it can project a big image on a wall. Um, interaction with things, I'm sure you've heard the, about the internet of things. This is the idea that physical objects will, will get RFID tags, will get tools that will mean, I mean, for, to give you a trivial example, you lose your smartphone or your keys and your computer can tell you where they are. Um, there's already a lot of that happening in logistics, so big companies like Walmart, for example, now put RFID tags on all of the packages as they are distributed through the Walmart empire so that they can keep track of them easily and automatically. Um, we said this is a sort of a more European than American perhaps government perspective that, that regulation would focus on consumer protection and privacy and that would increase users' trust in the technologies and their willingness to interact online. Uh, and that some governments, in terms of freedom of expression and, and censorship, <coughs> many governments probably would restrict access to some kinds of con local well, content based on local legal and cultural norms. Uh, some businesses would promote walled gardens where they try to get their customers to stay within their own websites, like Facebook, for example, you know, is, is, is trying to get content, people to read content within Facebook rather than going out to other websites because, of course, it means Facebook, first of all, know what you're reading so they can better profile your interests and then they can serve targeted advertising alongside. Uh, but we also suggested that user resistance to both would strengthen. You already see campaigning groups a lot like the EFF in the US, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. There are groups like that in Europe, people campaigning for digital rights, as they call them. Secondly, and again on the optimistic side, that uh, the internet could be used to support uh, a much greener society, and obviously this is a, a critical government concern with climate change. Um, of course, for, you know, remote working could save people from doing a lot of travel. Uh, you can also do a lot of monitoring, controlling, adjustment of carbon intensive activities. Uh, we have a lot of server farms today. You can do, one of the things you can do with cloud computing and remote server farms is make them much more energy efficient. Uh, you can do things, for example, like move um, the software that's running to the server farm that's consuming the least energy right now. And that might be, for example, because it's in a cold region where you don't need much air conditioning. Aircon is actually the major energy use in uh, server farms. And that's one reason companies like Google are building server farms in, uh, I think, Finland, for example, that is colder. But you can, you can move code very easily between servers, switch off some servers, perhaps. You know, when, if most of your customers are in bed, you know, if you're mainly you're an American company, OK, well, between, say, 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. Pacific time, you might be able to switch off 90% of your servers because they're not being used. So that will, that will save energy. Um, mobile platforms, uh, that's not so important. People tend to work from home by default, so saving all of that commuting. Uh, telepresence replaces much business travel, some tourism. That's the sort of, perhaps, the in a, in a really extreme way, have you, who's seen Total Recall, the, the current version or the 80s version, you know, that, that idea that you no longer have to physically go somewhere to experience it. Um, this is very optimistic that social networking tools uh, re reduce social divisions uh, and build political support for collective action. I think looking back, this, was, this report was maybe 18 months ago. I'd be more skeptical about that <laughs> happening now, sadly. Um, and that remote regions and developing countries become much better integrated into the global economy uh, and a lot of work could be outsourced to them, which would help their development. Of course, that might be controversial in the developed countries if uh, high value work services start to become outsourced as much as manufacturing has been outsourced in the last 20 years. That, you know, that might be very unpopular with the people in the developed world that previously were earning very nice salaries. Thank you very much for doing that work. This is the sort of cynical one, uh, the cynical scenario, which is which actually many of the we went out again and asked experts which they thought were the most likely scenarios. This was the one that many of them thought was most likely, um, that the internet basically <laughs> becomes cable TV, that it's a, a, a mass entertainment medium, that yes, you get high-speed access to the home, uh, but that's only with governments 
heavily subsidizing the, the, the build out of the, the fiber connections because it's pretty expensive and taking away regulatory constraints, basically allowing the companies that are building the internet high, high <coughs> bandwidth connections to do what they like with them to, to say ideas like net neutrality go out the window, that they can completely control then you know, what content is being served up to people, uh, that behavioral advertising is happening and so on. Um, that you tend to get the development of big, because of this sort of mega corporations that control, you know, the search engines, the social networks, the, the internet service access provision, you know, becomes like the huge entertainment conglomerates you already get, like Comcast. Um, you know, that, that this would be the sort of the deregulated um, uh, vision of the future internet. One way that it could develop uh, in that, that you get tacit cooperation between these these mega conglomerates and governments who are quite happy for them to block access to politically controversial uh, content. Do, do you know this? Who, who, who said this well-known phrase? Nice. Yeah, I'm glad you all know that. <laughs> I, I thought maybe people wouldn't, but you know, talking, talking about much earlier uh, entertainment products, but this, this is the idea that the, entertain, the, in, the internet sort of basically leads everyone to just slump, in, slump on their couch and watch YouTube all day. And, uh, not get upset about politics or, or anything like that, that people are intensively profiled for behavioral advertising, no effective privacy regulation, and that security concerns are used to limit what people can do online, that you have things like a requirement for equivalence of national ID cards <coughs> before people can post online. And you might think well, that sounds a bit extreme, but actually South Korea was doing that until quite recently, um, that you have severely restricted anonymous speech data retention laws that say ISPs have to keep lots of data about what their users are doing, where they're going online, who they're talking to, all accessible to law enforcement agencies, which again is, is, has happened in a number of countries and I'll come back to that later in this course. And then finally of our four scenarios, this is perhaps the sort of the utopian one, the idea that uh, the internet supports dis distributed, uh, decentralized grassroots <coughs> politics, that it helps people develop uh, collective action, that rather than just passive consumers, you have what are called prosumers, people producing content, you know, the web 2.0 idea that everyone's making their own videos, everyone isn't just sitting tuning into Warner's latest. Um, everyone has a, has a wide choice of internet service provider, lots of devices they can control and program for themselves, decide what software they want to own, change the software, open source software, build shared secure environments for for work and for leisure, that these digital rights groups become more influential, that things like privacy, free expression become really core values of the internet, uh, and that the, the participation in online communities then builds social cohesion and supports formerly disconnected minority groups. Last page. Um, and secondly, thinking about the developing world, that there's high, high demand. I mean, this much is, is certain. Uh, high demand for low-cost internet access devices. Um, and that could easily lead to a global market of 10 billion plus devices being on the internet. If you think the world population is you know, forecast to reach 10 billion by, I think, 2050. Certainly, in developed countries, there are more mobile phones than people already, because people have multiple phones. Uh, you know, that, that could be a worldwide phenomenon if the technology is cheap and easy enough to use. Uh, that could allow lots of individual entrepreneurs to build businesses which over the internet they would have access to this giant 10 billion uh, global marketplace um, that security mechanisms would be collaborative rather than controlling if you've seen for example the Berkman Center's Herdict project that's an example of a uh, collaborative security project where people individual users can report when they've had problems getting to a website or their, if their computer gets infected after visiting a website then it tells all their friends to warn them not to go to that website. And that, that the, the internet, in this sense, remains the same, a messy, inefficient, highly diverse bit of managed chaos. Sorry, what's that called? The Berkman Center? The Berkman Center, Herdict, H-E-R-D-I-C-T. So that's, a, that's enough for me. Uh, these are the questions we'll come back to in the seminar um, for discussion after your presentations. But do, rather than these, these broader discussions, is there any sort of immediate points of clarification you would like on the, the slides themselves? No? Yeah? 
Where do you see piracy going? That's a very good question, and I'll come back to it in the copyright lecture, which I think is next week or the week after. Yeah. In the going green slide, what do you think about the uh, resources needed for ICT device production? Yeah. Do I think they'll be available? How can this be more sustainable? I, was this even attainable? So sustainable in which sense? That it leads to environmentally friendly products or a, a larger number of people getting access to them? Or sustainable in the sense of being available for future generations as well? That's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, are, are you thinking of things like the, the Internet Archive? No, I'm thinking of um, the metals used. Oh, OK. Well, that's a very good question. Um, and. It's not one I'm actually so uh, well placed to answer. You could, you could probably give as good an answer as that as I could, to be honest. Okay. But you're right. It's it's a it's an important issue. What was that question? Uh, uh, sustainability of the hardware production. You know, will the will the precious uh, metal still be available in in ten years? It's a good question. Okay, so. That, that, that lecture was a bit more of me than I hope the remaining weeks will be. There's a bit more discussion in the remaining lectures, you might be glad to hear. But that was just a, sort of, a lot of information I wanted to get over to you. Um, so we'll have a five-minute break.